Gazing at the night sky can make us feel very big. As we learn more about the universe, we gain an understanding of the true vastness of space. Our size may shrink, but our wonder certainly won't. Hi, my name is Tracy Buden. I'm an amateur astronomer hoping to make it to the pros someday, and I'm here to help you guys learn how to navigate the night sky. We're going to show you some basic tools to help you get started with amateur astronomy. Refracting telescopes are the kind most people think of when they think of telescopes, the long spyglass type that pirates used. These types of telescopes were first used by Galileo to look at the stars. They use lenses to bend the light. You'll get a refraction when you visit the eye doctor for your contact lenses or glasses. Binoculars, like you see on the right here, are also a type of refracting instrument. Eyepieces for refracting telescopes are located at the back of the instrument. Sometimes you'll see a diagonal mirror supporting the eyepiece for the instrument. The objective lenses are what collects the light. The larger the objective lens, the more light you can collect. Binoculars will have specifications on the side. The first number shows how many powers it is times the human eye, the magnification. Mine are zoom binoculars, so they go in a range of 8 to 24 times the power of the human eye. The other number, 50, is the measure of the objective lens in millimeters. This is a 50 millimeter measurement here, the diameter of the objective lens. The objective lens for the Galileo scope happens to have a similar diameter of my binoculars, also 50 millimeters. The Galileo scopes were developed and built by astronomers for the International Year of Astronomy to help teach students optics. They're a fantastic tool for just starting out and will run you about 50 bucks if you can find them online. The optical pathway that you see here isn't identical to that of the Galileo scope but it gives the basic idea of refracting telescopes. Light comes into the front of the telescope, bends as it passes through the objective lens, with the distance between the objective lens and the point where the light converges again being the focal length of the telescope. The Galileo scope was actually developed so that you could use an eyepiece similar to what Galileo himself originally used, and this places the focal length actually at the eyepiece itself. Reflecting telescopes were developed by Isaac Newton when he wasn't inventing calculus or theorizing gravity or the other million and one things he did. Uh, reflection bounces the light with the mirrors, just like in your bathroom when you stare back at your own reflection. As opposed to bathroom mirrors, though, the reflective surface is actually on the front of the glass, so the light never passes through the glass in reflecting telescopes. Reflecting telescopes gather light with their primary mirror. So the larger your primary mirror, the more light you can gather. This particular telescope has a diameter of eight inches. There are different kinds of reflecting telescopes. Uh, my reflecting telescope is a spin on the Newtonian model. It's called a Dobsonian. And the light comes in from space, hits the primary mirror, which is a curved surface, and bounces back up to the secondary mirror, which is a plane surface that sits at an angle. The secondary mirror bounces the light through the eyepiece, as you see here. The smaller the diameter of your eyepiece, the bigger magnification you're going to get, the more zoomed in on the object you'll be. For larger eyepieces, larger diameters, you're going to get a wider field of view on the sky. For the Stopsonian, most Newtonian-style telescopes, you're going to get uh, this optical pathway, just like we described, where the incoming light comes in. From space hits that curved primary mirror, bounces back up to the secondary, and then out through the eyepiece. If you don't have binoculars or a telescope, that's okay because it turns out the human eye is a great optical instrument all on its own. You can purchase star wheels and other instruments to help you learn the sky. There's a link right here to a free one that you can print out onto cardstock and make yourself. It's a fun activity. And for the modern day astronomer, there's actually quite a few fun apps available that are really nice and help you learn the night sky from your backyard in the lawn chair. So I'm using an app right now called Solar System Scope. This is a free app and it helps us get an idea of how 
the bodies move within our solar system. This is sort of uh, realistic what they look like in terms of size and relationship to each other. The sun is so big that if we zoom in on it, you can actually fit 109 Earths across the surface of the sun. So that's pretty big. But if we travel out 93 million miles, one astronomical unit, we're gonna make it to the Earth. And I'm gonna change the settings on this just to make them be large so we can see the motions that I'm describing between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. So again, we've enhanced the sizes of the planets just so that we can see kind of what's going on with the dynamics in our solar system. So we're going to um, speed up time a little bit. And as the Earth spins, we'll see that the, time, the side that kind of faces the sun is daytime and the side that faces away is nighttime, which you know, seems pretty obvious and intuitive. But what isn't always obvious and intuitive is the moon, the path that the moon is taking. So the moon actually travels around with us. It's our little buddy. And when the moon is sort of coming behind us and we see the moon is full, we can actually see the entire surface that faces us is reflecting all that light from the sun. So that's when we get a full moon. And then as it comes around on the side, we'll start to see the sun set on the moon. And when the moon gets all the way back in front of us, where it lies between us and the sun, that's when we have a new moon. When we look at a new moon, um, it's, we're essentially seeing midnight on the moon. So there's no surface to really reflect the light back to us. We don't see a new moon in the sky. And as it comes around here, we're going to start to see the uh, waxing crescent, that moon getting bigger, and sort of sunrise on the surface of the moon until it gets all the way again back around to high noon, where the moon is once again full. Now it takes uh, 28 days to complete the cycle, and it only ever keeps that same side facing us. It's what we would consider tidally locked. And it's going to do this, you know, about 12 times in its, in our trip around the sun. So it takes us a year to come back to this point in time, this place in space. And it takes 12 months for the moon to make that same trip with us. This app is called Solarium. This is an open source planetarium app. It's free. It's a great tool and it's going to help us find our constellations and find our bearings in the night sky. Once you have your bearings, you can start to learn the patterns that are there and the patterns that we recognize, or you can even just make up your own constellations. So you're going to go outside about an hour after sunset. Then you're going to keep kind of that same time frame when you go outside and observe until you get used to the sky and then you can dark sky it up. So we're gonna take the twilight, that kind of residual glow from the setting sun, and we're gonna put it to our left. And then when we put it to our left, we're gonna see two pattern asterisms in the sky. When I say pattern asterisms and not constellations because pattern asterisms are kind of just a connection of dots that humans make, humans like to make patterns out of things, whereas constellations serve as a, a bigger swath of region in the sky. So the two pattern asterisms that we want to look for are a wonky W and the Big Dipper. So our wonky W sits right here. This is Cassiopeia sitting in her throne. And if we have Cassiopeia in the sky, we can actually take these two stars here and kind of form an arc over to Polaris. And if we have the Big Dipper in our sky, we're fortunate enough to have both right now because there are times of the year where you only have one or the other. But with the Dipper, you can actually use these two stars and the Dipper is much nicer because these two stars point, they point to Polaris. Well, Polaris is our North Star, it's a true North. So Earth has sort of a polar, axis and if we were to take our imaginary um, 
kind of coordinate system on Earth, our latitude and longitude lines, and project those out onto the nearby stars, our North Pole on Earth would line up pretty much close to uh, Polaris, the North Star. So if we're standing facing Polaris, everything that's to our right is going to be east, and everything that's to our left is going to be west. As we turn sort of west, we're going to see that's where the sun just set. And here we have Venus. And Venus right now happens to be in the uh, a certain constellation. So let's go ahead and um, turn on some constellation lines so we can see where it lies. So Venus is in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. Taurus has this red eye in Aldebaran, and it forms sort of a V here in his face, and his horns extend. There's the V. And his horns extend all the way out. He's a long horn. And his second horn comes out here. And if we go further up, we're going to see another constellation of Gemini the twins. And as we do this, we're going to start to realize that the constellations that we're seeing here are the constellations of the, the zodiac. And directly at our zenith, we're going to see the constellation of Leo the lion, where his mane kind of comes across here. his heart being Regulus, and his hindquarters back here. The last thing I wanted to share with you guys is the idea of an astronomical journal. Galileo kept a fantastic journal where he made sketches of the eyepiece. This concept is fairly accessible. You go outside and record the date and the time and the object that you're observing. This particular journal is for the moon. This is a free download from NASA. If you track the moon over the course of the month, you'll get a feel for its phases or its day and night cycle. Tracking the moon also gives you a feel for the path of the ecliptic, that path that the sun, the moon, and all the planets take through our sky.